Hi, my name is Mark Moffat, and I'm a production coordinator at GNAT TV. Today marks the 10th year of the pandemic, and for the occasion, we have the pleasure to be joined by a special guest, Carly Riley. In another lifetime, Carly was an independent producer for GNAT, and you may know her for the terrific show she created, Once Upon a Political Time. More recently, Carly spent time in Iowa, where she worked on Andrew Yang's presidential campaign team. Welcome, Carly. It's great to see you. Hello. And New York. I was mostly in New York with the campaign. <laughs> oh, were you? Did you? Yeah. Were you in New York mostly? See, yeah. like, I, I was in to... Iowa. I was in Iowa multiple times. So anyways, thank you. I'm so happy to, you know, get to catch up and chat with you. Great. It's fantastic. So I'm very curious. What's it like working on a national campaign? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was amazing and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, certainly I, I, really exhausting. Um, you know, I think something that was so, it's so funny to see kind of behind the curtain with anything um, and yeah. realizing like, this is how we pick like the leader of the free world. Like it's just a bunch of human beings like running around, like <laughs> trying to do the best they can and, and make these decisions and, yeah. you know, oftentimes really rapid time frames and, um, I mean, that was just something that stuck out to me was just kind of taking that peek behind and, and feeling and being like, wow, you know, this is all, it's all just humans <laughs> trying yeah. to do what they can yeah. do. I'm sure this was a rich act experience in many ways, but has this affected your, uh, your perception of the political process in this country? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I will say, I mean, working on Andrew's campaign was definitely distinct, I think, from a lot of other campaigns. And you know, even the fact that I was able to kind of step in when I did and then kind of ascend to have, you know, a lot of responsibility on the campaign as somebody who didn't have a campaign background, like that's not normal. So there was, there was so much about my experience that was distinctive. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I think I definitely have more thoughts around this whole process. I mean, now as I watch campaigns and I'm so much more cognizant of the decisions that are being made behind the scenes, yeah. you know, any sort of public, public facing appearance that, that Biden does or anybody else does. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was just how, how big the role of the media is in this um, and, and in the campaign process and in who we elect. Um, they, and it's twofold. It's like on the one hand, these news outlets really are still like, they are the gatekeepers and they determine who, who makes it and who doesn't. Yeah. On the other hand, their power is eroding. And this was something that was certainly clear for our campaign because we really gained prominence online and, and through podcasts, which are sort of this fringe to the, the mainstream media, right? Oh. Or like the legacy media. Um, so it, there's a weird balance happening there, but, but, but the media still is so, so important. And I had moments on the campaign being like, God, they really are such a friend to Donald Trump. It's like, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, this is something people said during the 2016 election, but I felt it in such a new way because we didn't, we, we were not given a lot of love by the media for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the most love we ever got was after <laughs> Andrew dropped out. Um, and, and it was, it was really difficult. Um, that, that did definitely make things much more challenging for us. And so to see that Andrew or that Trump got coverage, even if it was negative coverage, right. it's still so tremendously beneficial to just have those airwaves. Absolutely. And yeah, it was interesting to, to hear about how, how the debates, you know, how, how they parse everything by amount, the amount of time they give to people yeah. who, who they're betting on, it seems like. Like the media's betting that this person's interesting and this person's not. And that's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's messed up. But it's, it's... Well, it was interesting to me because to, in my mind, if you really want to have like a truly super democratic process, you should actually, you should give everyone equal time, certainly, but you should, if anything, give more time to the candidates that are least known, right? right? Um, so that everyone that you, like people are really able to see each candidate as, as generously as possible or, you know, as terribly as possible, but that seems like an odd route to go. So, so that was, that was definitely interesting. I mean, the debate format in general is, is a, is a really hard one because you're up there and the pressure is so intense and you're given, it's such a, it's such a sound bite right. conducive environment, right. which is not Andrew's style at all. Andrew really thrived in long form podcasts and he has time to kind of really flesh out and, and, you know, express his ideas. And, um, you know, in so many ways, the process for running for president, in my opinion, does not test the traits that you most want in a president. Oh. And that was something that was really striking to me. Um, and, and Andrew talked about this. He would say, like, because he's mostly been a CEO in his life or, you know, he ran a nonprofit. And he was like, you know, if 
like what he learned is what he kind of had to do on the campaign trail was sort of chase after the press and like, you know, try and get attention on himself to get his ideas out there. And he was like, if any CEO or like operator behave that way in business, like they would be the worst CEO ever. Like things would be crumbling behind them. And, and in many ways, and he's adamant that, you know, president shouldn't treat the country like a business. It's not, you know, there are, there are key differences there, but in many ways, like you want your president to be just like a problem solver, right. you know, figuring out how to get things done, not somebody who's chasing the media. Um, but the process of getting there requires you to sort of be, you know, a good soundbite speaker, very heavy on rhetoric, as opposed to maybe substance, you know, chasing press opportunities as opposed to like solving the problem. So you've got to master um, a lot of strange skills in order to pull that, that trick off. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't think it tests what we want ultimately in the president. So that that was definitely in, an interesting thing to sort of observe of like, we, <laughs> we got to figure out a new way to pick, <laughs> pick the person because... <laughs> As you worked on the campaign team, what what was your main role? What did you do? Were you, did you have a voice in it? Were there, were, like, was policy decided and then, and then you just sort of are, are there to implement the, getting the message out or what is, how, how does it work? Yeah, totally. So this was also, that was so interesting because on our, like most campaigns start out and they have experience and so they kind of know all the key distinct roles. And, and for us, we were much more like a startup that was sort of building the plane while we were flying. Um, so when I first joined, I was the fifth person to join the campaign team. So that was in the summer of 2018. And so at that point, I mean, we didn't have department, like we were just, we were five people trying to see what we could do. And so I was doing everything. I planned like our first national tour, which we took in November of 2018 to like seven cities. I was like writing press releases. Like it was such a joke, the amount of like having to kind of do everything um, that was happening at that point. Wow. And then um, in about, so, and, and so I sort of was in this jack of all trades role um, for, you know, six or seven months doing a lot of trip planning and, you know, uh, working with press a bit, not that we were getting that much of it, but, and then in, in mid 2019, I stepped in and became the finance director, the national finance director. So I, I actually had had a bit of a, of a fundraising background and it was sort of fortuitous timing. And, and I initially just stepped in sort of temporarily to, to help in this because we were starting to raise some real money and, and, and wanted to be raising a hell of a lot more of it. Um, and then it kind of stuck. And, and it, you know, I, again, I have experience calling donors and asking for money. And, and so I was able to just kind of pick that up. It was very like, you know, just fill in where, where the help is most needed. And then that stuck. And so from about, I guess it was July, I started that role, July of 2019 through to the end of the campaign, I was our, our national finance director and, and really trying to oversee that effort, which was, um, which was great. So I was definitely in a lot of rooms, but I, I wasn't involved on the policy side particularly. I mean, I, I was had to be looped in certainly to talk to donors about it. Um, but on our campaign, the policy usually stemmed from Andrew. Um, sometimes the policy team themselves would say, hey, we want to roll out something on this. And then Andrew was very involved. And it was a back and forth between the policy team and Andrew to, to like really finalize it and, and craft something. Um, yeah. So that, that there's like a whole, you know, a whole team that deals with all of that. Wow. So that's okay. It's great. It's great to, to learn. I didn't know that, that that's what you were doing there. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was stressful. <laughs> I don't doubt because, it. Yeah. You know, fundraising, it, it's all such a game where you put out your fundraising totals each quarter, right? So there's a lot of pressure going into those end of quarter deadlines um, because it's something that the media really uses as a marker for your legitimacy. And so there's that element of it is you want the press story out of it. Yeah. And then there's this whole other, the other element of you actually just need the money. So, and, and it, right. you know, it's, um, and as soon as like the one, the, you know, your first quarter ends, it's like, or, you know, as soon as the quarter ends, you're, you know, really feeling the pressure for the next one. And, and you have to show that growth quarter over quarter. And um, so, so yeah. as sad as I was when we suspended our campaign, I was also a little relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. great. Um, uh, this is, you know, it's the, there's a, there was a perception out there. I think it's probably uh, uh, crafted by the media. The, the perception that is that, that uh, Andrew uh, Yang ran on a, a single issue platform, and that was the universal basic income uh, platform. And, uh, and, the, and even though it was a single issue, it really addressed, uh, you know, socioeconomic inequality in the country. It, it, it also um, 
hope to address uh, the imminence of uh, robotics and AI and how that's going to displace workforce. And so it really speaks to the to the dignity of, of average citizens trying to navigate, you know, this tricky, tricky economic landscape that just got trickier, uh, of course, with the pandemic. But um, uh, I, I know that a lot of that is just perception. I know that Andrew Yang is like is a very uh, capable and brilliant guy, uh, you know. But at the same time, there was this perception that he was just doing this single kind of platform. And did he sacrifice broader appeal by narrowing it to one thing, or is that just what you have to do? Just have a sound bite and just you know, it's like this is what I do. This is what I yeah. do. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's it's an interesting question. I think. Um... So, I mean, I could talk about this for a long time. Like, the the inception of Andrew's campaign or the reason he ran is because he had been running a nonprofit that was uh, centered around trying to create jobs, mm-hmm. you know, in, like, Detroit and, and Birmingham and Cleveland and Baltimore. Like, that was, they were kind of an entrepreneurship, you know, like, incubator in places because he looked around and said, look, you know, we have all of this brain talent going to Silicon Valley and Wall Street and it's like killing us. <laughs> and so you basically have these like two hubs where you have like innovation happening at a, at, you know, and, and, um, and so it was in doing that work that he started to observe he, the way he puts it is he felt like he, that he was pouring water into a bathtub where the hole ripped out the bottom, like mm-hmm. the amount of jobs we were losing and the economic trends that were at play that he was trying to work against were so huge. Um, and so then when Trump won, he started really digging into the numbers and seeing um, seeing kind of the economic story that was happening under the surface that that isn't reflected often in the unemployment numbers now being a totally different world, obviously. But, um, and and he, he talked to a lot of really smart people and, and, and UBI was really where he came down in terms of like, this is just the single, the single best thing we could do to help. Um, and it's interesting. While I was doing my show on GNAT, I was doing a lot of a lot of research for my show, which you know. And and I had read a book about UBI as well because I had kind of been coming to a similar conclusion. Andrew was coming to it from the automation story. I was seeing a lot of other things that were making me quite alarmed. But fundamentally, it's all about income inequality and and yeah. you know economic inequality. And yeah. and really, there's just no better way to address that than to directly give people money. And I could go on for a while about how strange I think it is that we're also resistant to this idea, right. and that especially Democrats who, in theory, like trust people right. then still need to design like every bureaucratic program in the world to like filter that money down as opposed to just like giving like trusting people and like letting them control their own right. lives but that's a whole nother separate topic so this was this was what he was coming to and why he was so he was like something needs to be done and so for him um the the need to run on like a national level as opposed to starting he was asked a lot like why didn't you run for mayor first or this and that was he really felt like he needed to mainstream uh this concept on a national level as quickly as possible because we're like 10 years out from, you know, self-driving trucks and cars, which is going to be devastating, you know, and on and on. So um, that was why he decided to go nationally and, and, and focus on this because that was his whole goal was to get this mainstreamed. I think we feel really gratified and a lot of us on the campaign have been texting and and Andrew as well to say like, as horrible as the whole COVID situation is, um, hold on. Hey, I'm on an interview. Okay. Anyways, um, as as horrible as the whole COVID situation is, um, you know, at, at least we sort of got this idea out there. There's a big question of like, would we be talking about these twelve hundred dollar, you know, cash transfer payments to people right now, and would that be happening right now if it weren't for the fact that we Andrew had sort of normalized this idea over the course of his campaign, or would we only be talking about more like like the small business, lo- like all the like these programs that are much more complicated than just a direct cash transfer payment. So looking at what's happened in the COVID response, we feel like a lot of our goal was achieved. Um, and, and so that, and not, you know, we want, we want a lot, we want a lot more progress to happen, but, um, but that was, I guess, like the reason he really focused on this one issue. Now with that said, which you and I talked about, he actually had an unbelievable, ro- like robust uh, policy platform. Um, so there were a lot of issues he was focused on. It wasn't just the UBI. and He can speak really competently about a whole range of things, but um, sticking to the UBI message was definitely um, strategic and tactical because that was the one he really wanted to drill into people's heads. Um, and it definitely served as well. I, I can, sorry, not to be so long-winded on all of this. <laughs> no, 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 no. Keep going. 
But I, I will say like, that was something we, we talked about a lot in the beginning when we didn't have traction because I joined in the summer of 2018 and we were like, I mean, just toiling in such obscurity at that point. And I give a lot of credit to our campaign manager, Zach Rauman, who was like, no matter how much criticism we got from people who were like, you'll never get bigger if you don't stop, t- if you don't start talking about other things, if you don't like kind of change the message, essentially. Um, Zach was like, nope, like this is our message. This is our message. Like, yeah. stay on course. Um, mm-hmm. and people need to hear things a lot before it starts to, to sink in. Yeah, right, um, yeah. so I, I think it served us really well to be like, stay on message. This is, this is what it's all about. We need people to understand like, this is what's coming down the pike and this is the best way to, to address it. So very good. Very good. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed seeing him on Bill Maher's show. Uh, yeah, uh, the second I, I, really, I really enjoyed him. But I was a little dismayed uh, two weeks later when uh, Bill was sort of just going through the field the, uh, of the Democratic uh, Party's field. And he, 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 he just, he said, uh, he came to Andrew Yang, he said, brilliant guy, he's in the wrong business. And, mm-hmm. and, and, that, and, and that was like, I was like, I was very dismissive, you know, but, you know, he was just trying to you know, winnow the field himself in in his own mind, I'm sure. But I was, uh, I was a little surprised to see him just uh, dismiss him so quickly. We had a couple of those. So uh, Andrew was on Bill Maher's show twice. I actually was with him for the first, his first appearance on Bill Maher. And after, and after, and he went on Bill Maher before the first debate. Um, And then uh, like after the first debate, Bill was like, Andrew needs to drop out. Like he was really kind of a jerk about it because Andrew's performance was not, not as bad. And uh, and then Andrew continued to kind of do well, and in the second debate was actually very strong. And so Bill invited him back on, and then was like, I think, a lot more interested in him and likes his ideas a lot. Right. Um, but he, he did kind of all along, I think, have that desire to to winnow the field a bit. Yeah. Um, and the wrong business it, it comment is interesting. There, Charles Blow, um, the New York Times yeah. columnist or reporter, um, had met Andrew at Bill Maher's show, and then wrote a whole piece about, like, or included a his first meeting with Andrew um, oh, okay. in a piece he wrote about Andrew in the New York times. And it was really flattering. And he was like, you know, I met Andrew like backstage at Bill Maher and uh, he was so like genuine. He's like, usually when I meet candidates, they know on this report, you know, on New York times and things so, like they're, they're always kind of angling and it's like, they're trying to like impress me or get this across. And he was like, Andrew, like, you know, couldn't have given less of a damn, you know, <laughs> like Andrew was like, Hey man, like just, and that Andrew is kind of like, like almost pathologically, like doesn't really care what people think, which again is a great quality in a president because he's right. so not right. you know, impressed by, you know, he's not going to kowtow to a lobbyist or this and that because he just yep. does not care. Um, yeah. But I think that also maybe plays into why Bill's like wrong business because he just doesn't have that like, I'm going to schmooze you and like work you kind of uh, temperament. He's just like who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was actually impressed by the democratic field. I enjoyed the, the even though it was just a mess. I mean, yeah. just, it, I mean, I enjoyed seeing like that many people, you know, trying to throw and trying to pull this off. And, um, um, how do you feel, uh, going towards November? How do you feel about, uh, the, the political landscape? Do you have any thoughts about it or are you just like tired of politics at the moment or, I will say I'm a little tired. Like after we suspended, I actually didn't watch the debate in South Carolina because I was so, (laughs) I was such a a shell of a human being. Campaigns are like notoriously really, really taxing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I really was kind of laid out. I um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, you know, and anybody who kind of thinks they do is, is obviously lying. (laughs) Um, I'm a little stressed about it. Um, Certainly. Um, I actually think the Biden campaign is, has been pretty smart all along in that they haven't, they have kind of kept, tried to keep Joe kind of above the fray with a lot of stuff, you know, like he didn't do all the same cattle calls as all the, the, the other candidates. Like they, they kind of knew out from out the gate that he was the front runner and that he should be kind of running against Trump from the outset. Yeah. So I don't feel like there were too many, like he didn't try and get too progressive during the primary, right. Which is, good right. going into the general. There aren't a bunch of sound bites of him saying things that are going to, you know, but he's got other baggage, um, yeah. as we all know. Um, yes. so, so yeah, I mean, on, on the, on the one hand, I'm, I think he's got a better shot than a lot of people would have. Um, but it, you know, the debates scare me a little bit, like what these debates will be yeah. Trump versus Biden. Um, and I do think the debates are, are 
really impactful and it is a place where a lot of people kind of make their decisions. Um, I will say on the finance side, because that was obviously my world, I am, you know, Bloomberg will make sure we, the Democrats are, are fully financed. So I, I feel grateful for that because Trump is raising money like, no, like nothing that's ever been done before. And so at least we have a billionaire who will make sure that Joe Biden is, is fully financed for the entire, you know, the entire course of it. Have you learned anything special that you would like to see part of? Oh, no, I should put, I should, I should skip that question. When are you going to run for president? That's, that's my question. <laughs> oh boy. I, you know, you watch something closely enough and you're like, I want no part of this insanity. Oh, come um, on. You could do no, it. I mean, I want to, I mean, I love politics, um, but I'm definitely more interested on, in being more probably on the media side of it than I am in the, in the, the thick of the, the thick of it. Um, yeah. I mean, Andrew, Andrew's talked about this. He's like, people, like people act like running for president is sort of like an ego boost or like, you know, I think especially around Hillary, there was a sense of like, Oh, she, you know, just wants all the attention or she's so power hungry or whatever. And he's like, this is like the, like, I like, this is not an ego boost. <laughs> like you run through the gauntlet and are attacked for so many things. Like you didn't even know were wrong about you, you know? Yeah. And, and it's so hard and 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 in the there's such a, a blessing and a curse with the 24 hour news cycle like on the one hand everything is captured now you know you don't have a kind of a moment to slip up on the other hand everything is forgotten so quickly um you know like we talked about like like the dean scream you know our you know uh, howard dean obviously from vermont okay. who's like chances at the presidency were arguably like ruined when he had this weird scream he did in iowa like that would be a blip today you know like if that had happened yeah you know, if that happened today, it would be, you know, it wouldn't, right. it wouldn't think a presidency because there's so much happening at any given time and people aren't all watching the same thing anymore. So That's half right. the population would even miss, would, you know, miss the story. It's like, you know, right. um, so, so yeah, I, I, you know, certainly no plans in any time soon to kind of hop into the political sphere. I think I'm going to probably kill my odds too by being in the media and cursing too much and, you know. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> no, those will be blips too. It's true. It's Nobody true. will yeah. notice. Nobody will know. Yeah. No, no. Well, you're still pretty young, but like, <clears throat> I think you'd be great. Thank uh, you. I know it's hard work. It'd be hard, hard, hard work. The hardest work ever, but. Um, yeah. I like I sleep you... too. And, you know, that's something that really goes out the window, both yeah. on a campaign and then obviously yeah. even more so your president. So yeah. I don't know. I'd be the, the nappiest president of all time, as in like taking naps. <laughs> yeah. So listen, I'm, I'm going to wrap up, uh, but uh, uh, thank you so much for doing this. And yeah, it's so great yeah. to see you. And uh, Yes, me too. We'll have to, you are, and I have to catch up. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, take care. And, yeah, uh, thank you so much. And we'll do this again sometime when, uh, yeah. when, I don't know, maybe we'll see each other in person someday. Yeah, that would be lovely. Maybe any of us will see anybody in person again yeah. someday. Hey, what are you doing with your time now? What are you, what, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Oh, boy. So, I mean, I feel so I feel so fortunate because I was kind of planning on being kind of having some downtime right now anyways. Um, yeah. I, you know, I didn't feel the, as much pressure. Um, I am I'm doing a lot of writing. So I've been writing some articles. I'm trying to get them placed in some maybe some national publications. And then I... Uh, I, I am sort of toying with a book. I've got a bit of a book proposal going. And um, anyways, I'm going to hopefully start some conversations with with uh, some people about that. But we'll see. But it's been great. I'm just like, I'm writing as much as I possibly can. And um, and it's been kind of fun just to get it all out. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Really yeah. glad to hear that. This is an interesting, this is a good time for, for creative people. It's a very good I know. Time. Although it's also like a super competitive time. Like, you know, I'm trying to get like articles placed and they're like, we love this, but we have like literally like everybody and their mother is like, <laughs> is writing right now because nobody has anything else to do. So yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, well, thanks Mark. I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks take care. Glad to be back in Vermont. Okay, Bye. cool. All right. Bye.